our mental states, how we learn, how we are motivated, how we make decisions, uh, the nature of forgetting, the nature of all of the emotions, those are features of the physical brain, the brain inside our heads. And uh, it seemed to me kind of um, important that if you were going to try to understand the nature of those functions, that you learn everything you possibly could, whatever was available about the nature of the physical brain itself. Hello, my geeseling. It is Mother Goose, Robinson Earhart here with the introduction to Robinson's podcast, episode 48. I'm also with Pins, who has been quite mischievous today, uh, getting in all sorts of aforementioned mischief while I'm trying to record podcasts. But as you can see, I also have a new microphone, which is very exciting. Uh, we're moving up in the podcast world. And today is quite indicative of that because my guest is Patricia Churchland, who is UC President's Professor of Philosophy Emerita at the University of California, San Diego. And if you're a philosopher, Patricia Churchland needs absolutely no introduction. Uh, she is the founder or one of the founders of neurophilosophy, or maybe you'd say she's one of the first neurophilosophers, which advocates the, I'd say the blending of, well, you, you probably just heard actually in the, the introduction, but I, I'll put it in my words, advocating maybe the blending of neuroscience with the philosophy of mind, or it's the idea that you can't do philosophy of mind well without taking into account everything we know about the brain. And in this conversation, Pat and I talk about three broad questions in the philosophy of mind and about neuroscience's impact on how we might answer those questions. So the three things we discuss are morality and ethics. And in particular, on that account, we talk about topics that can be found in two of her recent books, Brain Trust, What Neuroscience Tells Us About Morality, and conscience, the origins of moral intuition. And then we also talk about free will and the mind and consciousness. And in particular, when we discuss consciousness, we talk about David Chalmers' hard problem of consciousness. And so this, this was a great conversation. I'm so thankful that Pat was willing to have it with me. And you can keep up with her work at patriciachurchland.com or on Twitter at Pat Churchland. So, without any further ado, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed talking about that. So, I, I'm taking a, a neuroscience course this uh, quarter, and I was talking to my professor last week, and... I mentioned that we were going to talk, and he was very excited. His name is, is Brian Wandell. At Stanford, you're taking the course. Yeah, yeah. his name is Brian Wandell. He does. Oh yes. uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, neuroscience of the visual system, yeah, and yeah. I asked him if he knew you, and he said he does, but he actually knows your children better than he knows yes, you. Yes, I think that's probably right. And I, I was like, oh, "Well, that's very strange." So then I I looked up your family <laughs> and. Both of your children are neuroscientists. As your, it turned out. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and your husband, obviously, Paul Churchland, another tremendously famous and influential neurophilosopher. Yeah, we all word, sort but... of uh, got bitten by the bug, I think. Yeah. Yeah. How did that happen? How did you end up raising two neuroscientist children? Well, you know, I think it didn't necessarily have so much to do with us as it had to do with the fact that neuroscience in the last 20 years, 30 years, has been so rich and exciting that it really draws people in. And, uh, and the, the tools and the techniques for making progress and doing experiments that give you meaningful results and connecting to genetics, that's all become richer and richer as time has gone on. And so I think that it has appealed to many people across the board for that reason. And also perhaps for the reason that, you know, it helps us learn a little bit maybe about ourselves. 
and why Maybe. we are the way we are, and we have these funny little quirks or you know funny ways of doing things, and uh, and maybe helps us understand a little bit about ourselves and, and other humans, but also helps us, and especially now that people are are using uh, FMR for for dogs, uh, it helps us also understand the human dog relationship as well as the brains of other non human mammals and birds. And so I think it's just it has been such a very exciting time that it drew people in. Hmm. Well, as I was looking at your family as well, I saw that neither of your parents uh, graduated from high school. No, and then, that's right. And then yet here you are, I mean, such an esteemed philosopher, and then your children, neuroscientists, your husband, neuroscientists. How did your upbringing at home from two parents that weren't really heavily involved in the in academia or the educational system end up producing you? Well, it's an interesting question. And I think, you know, those were, I was born in 1943. So it was still, um, it was just before uh, the, the end of the Second World War. And I knew a lot of people growing up who had essentially never gone to college. And in the area in British Columbia, <clears throat> where we lived, and I think that was much more sort of uh, undeveloped, shall we say, than the more eastern provinces like Ontario, um, it was still pretty wild. And, um, and that was true for, you know, not just our particular family, but most of the people that I knew growing up in this very rural and very beautiful, actually, area of British Columbia. But many of the farmers were very practical people, and they uh, had to solve all kinds of problems in a very practical way. And that often meant that um, they, they were very bright, and they went about things in a very systematic way, and they didn't like to be confused and hornswoggled by somebody who had magical ideas. Uh -huh. and, um, and, and so I think they were just very, very practical. And my father, although he had only a seventh grade education. Oh, wow. He, yeah, yeah. He went to work mm. when he was 12 as a printer's devil in a small town in Alberta. and I'm sorry, did you say a printer's devil? A printer's devil. And I don't know what that is. Devil do? Well, in the old print shops, you know, there were, there was the great big printing press, but there was also a linotype machine, which made the type out of lead. And then you would put the lead into trays and then you would print your newspaper. Uh, and, and, the linotype was able to print a type that was quite large for headlines or small for the rest of it. Anyway, the printer's devil uh, had the job of keeping the print shop more or less clean and orderly because with all of this lead and, and ink and paper flying around, it could get really very messy. So he learned, he learned the printing trade from an actual print shop, a newspaper shop. And at night, he didn't have very much to do, but there were books around. And he read everything he could get his hands on because there wasn't much else to do. And one mm -hmm. of the things that he read was Darwin's Origin of Species. And that had a huge effect on how he thought about everything and saw everything. Okay, so he was clearly a super intellectual, so, intelligent, curious person. So he even was, he didn't, he was better educated than many of the people I knew when I went to college. <laughs> and my mother um, worked as, uh, I think she was about 13 when she went, she was sent to live with the family and help raise their children. And they helped her because when by the time she was, I think, 16, they sent her um, to a small hospital in the northern part of British Columbia where she trained as a nurse. So she actually became a registered nurse. So she had qualifications as well. But again, you know, being a nurse at that time meant you were hugely practical. 
And um, I think she had a very inquiring mind. This In Hazleton, there were still many, many indigenous people living close by who came into the hospital for one thing or another, and she helped vaccinate them against smallpox and so forth. So she had a very interesting life as well. Um, and by the time I was in school, it was the end of the war. And one of the things that happened was there were a lot of people who were displaced at the end of the war, at the war in Europe. And some of those people came from Germany and they were extremely well educated, very knowledgeable, very well read. Some of them came from England and Scotland where they couldn't get jobs after the war. And, uh, and so we ended up having fabulous teachers in our school. They were really well educated, they cared, they were delighted to be out of Europe and they loved living in this beautiful place and they inspired us in all kinds of ways. So there were many, many factors that kind of went into the pudding as it were. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was just very lucky, I think, to be living in the right place at the right time. And uh, so lots of us ended up going to college where none of our parents or grandparents had ever set foot in a college. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my my mom talks about that as like sort of the immigrant mindset is Ooh. making sure your, your children get to college, get oh, the best for them. Oh, it was wonderful. Them. Yeah, it was really great. Mm -hmm. One of the people who taught me mathematics, who was wonderful, was a Scotsman who had contracted malaria during the war. He had a PhD in math and physics, so he was very, very well trained. But because he had malaria, he, he, his health was, was rather fragile. So it was fine for him to be hired at the high school. And when he had a bout of malaria during the year, he just had to take a couple of weeks off and we did our best. But he was fabulous because he loved math and physics and he really instilled that love um, in us. So it was a, it was a, a kind of rare and magical time in British Columbia, and and we were really the beneficiaries of it. Mm. Well, before we get into some of the specifics of your work, you identify as a neurophilosopher, and I think you were the first person to use that term, at least in print. Am I right? I think so, although somebody yeah. mentioned to me recently that Schopenhauer came very close to saying something similar, but uh, I didn't follow it up, so that could be right. <laughs> I don't know. Well, just what does it mean to be a neurophilosopher? And, I mean, what distinguishes the way that your you work or your approach to philosophy from what was done before you, maybe, in the philosophy of mind? Well, in I think that I like the expression neurophilosophy because it sort of encapsulated the idea that our mental states, how we learn, how we are motivated, how we make decisions, uh, the nature of forgetting, the nature of all of the emotions, those are features of the physical brain, the brain inside our heads. And uh, it seemed to me kind of... Um, important that if you were going to try to understand the nature of those functions, that you learn everything you possibly could, whatever was available about the nature of the physical brain itself. And that seemed at the time to many people to be really outrageous. And really? partly it was because they thought that their intuitions could tell them really important truths about the nature of, say, decision-making. And I thought, and I think I learned this from Paul, really, that intuitions are just fine as a place to start, but it's no place to end. And that's because one of the things that we knew then from the history of science was that as the science, whether it's physics or chemistry or biology, as the science proceeds, our old intuitions kind of get challenged and sometimes overturned and sometimes surprised. And so um, I think we felt that 
it, our intuitions about ourselves and how our brains say remember something um, might be a place to start, but what you really wanted to do was the experiments. Mm -hmm. Well, I told you that, I mean, when we were talking before recording that what I really wanted to discuss with you in this conversation was how neuroscience or your approach to neurophilosophy sheds light on important philosophical questions. And a place that I thought we might start is with ethics and morality, because mm -hmm. you've recently written Conscience, The Origins of Moral Intuition. And then you also wrote Brain Trust, which is another book about neuroscience and morality. So first of all, I mean, ethics and metaethics aren't typically associated with philosophy of mind or neuroscience. I so, suppose that's true, yes. Yeah. So did you decide to write these books because you were unhappy with the way that ethics and metaethics have been investigated separately from the mind or, or what motivated these Yeah, books? no, that's, it, it is a really interesting question. And here I think the only philosopher I had read either as an undergraduate or a graduate student, the only philosopher I read who ever seemed to me to have anything sensible to say about ethics was hmm. Hume. And he talked about the moral sentiment um, as a kind of sort of emotional but cognitive state that probably is part of human nature and that motivates us to consider doing certain things or to refuse to consider doing certain things. And moreover, he thought it was very trainable by learning and experience. And that seemed to me to be very plausible. And it seemed to me vastly more plausible than talking about the truths of reason. And, or it seemed to me more productive than, than trying to drum up counterexamples to utilitarianism. And it also suggests to me that, it, that other cultures may do, may have moral practices or moral values that are different from our own, but that just because we talk about pure reason doesn't mean that ours are correct and theirs are wrong. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. there may be, it may be that in the case of, of normative structures, that they adapt through time as a function of environment and conditions and people and so forth. And that we shouldn't be too quick to say something is absolutely right because it goes against the, the principles of pure reason, which would be the sort of Kantian way of, of thinking about it. So I never really expected to have anything to say about the nature of morality at all. Um, so it was really a great surprise to me when um, Larry Young, who is a neuroscientist from, uh, from Georgia, came from Atlanta, came to give a talk at the Salk, and I was sitting there taking some notes, and this was the story of the contrast between the prairie voles and the montane voles in their reproductive behavior. And as you know, the basic story is that montane voles behave the way we think most animals do, which is the male and the female meet, they mate, and then they go their separate ways. And the prairie voles, they meet, they mate, and now they're bonded for life. And that in and of itself, I thought, what? How can that be? What is the, uh, what is the circuitry story behind bonding for life? And what does that really entail? Well, Larry Young went on to tell us about that. And he said, partly what it means is that the male helps uh, take care of the pups. The female will be off feeding. He'll defend the pups and take care of them. It means that um, sometimes he will find food and, and bring it back. Um, and, and it means that the female stays with him for sort of litter after litter. 
Now, how can that possibly work in the brain? I mean, is there a sort of, you know, monogamy switch in there? What happens? And at that point, of course, Larry has studied, as many other people have studied much more about the relevant circuitry. But what Larry realized at the time was that one difference that seemed to make a difference in monogamy bonding was the density of receptors in the brain in a very specific region for the hormone, the peptide oxytocin or the peptide vasopressin. And so his lab, <clears throat> excuse me, his lab did all of the manipulations that are kind of obvious, um, blocking receptors, doing genetic changes to produce receptors and so forth. And it seemed quite evident that although it was not clearly not the whole story of the behavior of Montaigne Voles and the contrast to, to um, uh, Prairie Voles, that this was a really, really important part of the story. And I went home and Paul and I talked about this and talked about this. I just thought it was amazing and began to think that bonding behavior is, is, can be really very complex. And if it involves one animal helping another, and it turns out, of course, that this is even true in community of prairie voles, that something like that and something like the circuitry involving oxytocin and vasopressin, but also the endorphins, the things that make you feel good, uh, that 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 might be a part of the story that we'd never really thought about. And I thought, if Hume was at this dinner table now, he'd be slapping his thigh and talking about the moral sentiment, and I'd be cheering him on. Sounds mm -hmm. like the moral sentiment to me. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of um, totally unexpected. I was deep into ideas about learning and perception and so forth. And Larry Young's talk just turned me around. Well, you've written that evolution is quite conservative. Once uh, something works, uh, it doesn't get uh, selected out, so to speak. And we so we retain a lot from earlier life forms. And is it right then to guess that the way that you would go about <clears throat> investigating morality in humans from a neuroscientific perspective is that you would start by looking at more I don't know if calling them less evolved is correct because they've been evolving for as long as us, yeah, but right, right. Uh, I'll just call them more primitive life forms like uh, prairie voles and montane voles. Oh, I think so. I okay. think so. And, you know, it turns out that although birds have a quite independent evolution of us, there are many species of birds that also depend on and use, amongst other things, oxytocin and vasopressin for long-term pair bonding. And, and what is vasopressin? I, I know that oxytocin... It's very similar to oxytocin. It's not clear how exactly the, the functionality is different. Um, there was some early work suggesting that uh, vasopressin was more common in the males of the species and was more apt to be to play a role in defense of the nest, for example than oxytocin but but the story is clearly very complicated and uh both of those elements seem to be really important they're very similar they're sometimes referred to as um sibling peptides because i think they differ only in uh in two places they're small peptides and um, they're very ancient and they can be used, I think, for many different kinds of things. But it turns out that, especially in the context of the endorphins, the natural opiates, that they can play this very important role of uh, having us, if I can put it this way, having us care for each other. Hmm. Um, and um, there's much that remains to be discovered. But of course, in the case of dogs, um, I think many people immediately began to think about the attachment of dogs, uh, both 
in the context of wolves attachment to each other and to the pack, but dogs attachment to humans and their willingness to defend to the death sometimes the human to whom they are attached or the family to who they are attached. And for a long time, I think philosophers laughed at people who said, isn't that, you know, sacrifice? Isn't that altruism? Isn't that morality? <laughs> just dogs, they're just doing what they're, you know, they're just doing what they're wired to do. Like we aren't. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hmm. And so, so the dog work, and my favorite person here in the dog land is, is Gregory Burns, who was in Terry's lab at the Salk when I was there. So I got to know him pretty well. And he uh, was actually doing an MD, PhD, and he is really a psychiatrist. But his real interest is in dog brains. And he's learned how to train dogs to stay still in a functional MR so we can learn things about dog brains and how they are the same or different with respect to social functions, how they are the same or different uh, from humans. And, and the work's just awesome. Now, the I mean, the natural question that comes to mind for me now is, where in the sort of evolutionary hierarchy do you begin to look when you're asking specifically about human morality? I imagine you're not going to go all the way back to bacteria, but then I think, well, the social insects are clearly very socialized. I don't know if um, they have any sort of proto-morality, but then certainly... By the time you get to warm-blooded animals, yeah. uh, you do see that. I don't know about, sure. yeah. So where do you start? Well, I think it's a, it's an interesting question, and and you know one of the things that that Paul has long advocated is that for many of these ideas, like what is morality and when is an action in the category of being a, a moral action. For many, many kinds of categories, we can't really hew out necessary and sufficient conditions. That is, we can't really, without looking kind of dumb, we can't make a precise definition. Now, you can for something like what is an acid or what is a protein, but you really can't for something like um, learns. What you can do is talk about the prototypical cases. And there we can agree what constitutes a moral action. And then the degree to which these outside cases are somewhat similar to the prototypical cases, we say, well, you know, that's kind of it's kind of moral-like. So for example, We think that if a human family adopts an orphan child and rears it as their own, that that is a really prototypical case of altruism. Now, Mm -hmm. what we know is that chimpanzees will do that too. That male chimpanzees will adopt an orphan baby whose mother died or was killed. And it's a non-trivial job. You might think, well, that's that's just chimpanzees. How hard can it be? And the answer is really quite hard because the dad has the, the, the and, and, and by the way, they tested to see whether it was the biological father who adopted the baby. And the answer is it was not. It was just a nice guy who did it. Five particular instances in five different chimpanzee troops The dad has to carry the baby chimp on his back. He has to teach him how to crack nuts with a rock. He does all of those wonderful things. And that seems to me to be pretty darn close to the prototype of altruism that I outlined. And we see orphan adoption in other contexts as well with other other species. Bonobos do it, but other species as well that you might not think of as sophisticated. For example, voles will do it. So um, so I, I try to steer clear of giving a precise definition of, of many of these kinds of concepts and rather say, look, you know, we're in the domain of fuzzy boundaries. 
of cases where we agree, of outlier cases. And, you know, let's go with the best we got. So maybe the strategy that I was outlining where you might pick a place at which proto-morality begins doesn't really work doesn't what you really, do. It doesn't really get a grip somehow. Sure. Except that I have to say, I do find it sometimes surprising when somebody will explain to me about an animal behavior in a beaver, for example, that you think, really? Well, isn't that nice? You know. <laughs> so I don't know. Do you have something in mind for beavers? Uh well, I mean, they will do infant adoption also. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hmm. Yeah. Now, we, we've talked a little bit about oxytocin. How does oxytocin and vasopressin, how do they contribute to our socialization and our sense of morality beyond this sort of, I don't know, not morally charged sense of attachment yeah. that we might have? I don't think it's really well understood. Um, okay. I think that we do know about the very particular regions in the brain where there are high density of receptors for oxytocin and vasopressin. Um, and we can lesion those, for example, and see what happens. But I think the story is really complex and it involves many features. And some of the, the neuroscientists who've worked on this, I think are really well placed to talk about this better than I. But that recognition of individuals is obviously very important um, in order to be able to say uh, that this is an individual that we're going to embrace or that needs help or that whatever. Um, and other cognitive functions are, are going to be playing a role as well. And if, for example, I, I don't know this to be true, but if, if the chimpanzee troop was very short on food and everybody was kind of struggling, would the male chimpanzee adopt the orphan baby? And I think the answer is, well, we don't really know, but we do know in the case of for example, wolves and others, that when times are really, really tough, sometimes the young are sacrificed uh, in order that those who are reproductively able uh, can eat and have others. And so how those things all work and interact and so forth, uh, I think really is, is something that many people are now exploring. The domain of social behavior has really, really become important uh, in neuroscience and, uh, and in psychology, and a lot of very beautiful work is being done. Now, another mechanism that you've pointed to in your writing for the development of morality is imitation. And through imitation, I assume that... Uh, that points to mirror neurons. Now, like uh, another buzzword like quantum, I think mirror neurons get really misconstrued in popular culture and used for all sorts of things. So one, I guess the first part of my question is how exactly does imitation or this neural disposition to imitate contribute to morality? But maybe before that, if this indeed does come from mirror neurons. Maybe you could lay out precisely what mirror neurons are. Well, I guess the, the, I, I don't know actually the present state of the, the mirror neuron story, but, but the idea does seem to be that, that if, if one observes someone else doing a certain thing, um, then there are certain neurons in the corresponding regions of the, the relevant parts of the brain that will be somewhat active, as though they know that, that for example, my doing this, uh, that, that that's got to do with a hand and a nose. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, I don't know the degree to which the mirror, mirror neurons constitute even a system at all um in in the way that you know we think stereopsis constitutes a system within the visual system 
so I, I don't really know that at this stage. And uh, learning, learning turns out to be such a rich and complex area. There's so many right. different different components that can be engaged as an animal makes its way in life. And certainly imitation can can be very important. And mm-hmm. um, and sometimes it's rather surprising when, you know, for example, you have a certain funny behavior and one day you realize your dog is imitating you. Oh, really? <laughs> Does your dog imitate you? Yeah. I mean, a very simple behavior. And uh, so... So I clearly <laughs> imitation is is very important. I mean, we know, especially in vocal learners, um, that there are very particular genes that are essential for vocal learners to do vocal learning. And um, are you referring to birds or yes, oh, um, okay. yeah, yeah, for yeah. for birds in particular, yeah. So, uh, so probably imitation is an important part of learning, but clearly um, many aspects of how to live a social life within the community uh, have to be learned and have to be picked up. And that's been observed by people who, who uh, watch wolves, for example, and, and watch how the, the young learn to do all of the things that, that wolves need to do in, in including, you know, hunt down predators, uh, which is, I think, not an easy job for the most part. Mm-hmm. When I, I look at my dog who's sleeping on the bed with my cat right now, it's actually, it's quite <laughs> cute. But I suppose that in some rudimentary way, he will imitate me or mirror me when I get excited. Oh, if I'm yes. like If I'm jumping around, he'll start jumping around. Absolutely. If I start running, he'll run, like that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, they do pick up on that. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Beyond oxytocin, vasopressin and mirror neurons, are there any other very important structures or processes in the brain or in simply our DNA that contribute on a, a major level to our development of morality? Well, I think it's generally believed that the endogenous opiates, such as the endorphins and the encephalins, because they um, produce feelings of, of pleasure, uh, play a very important role in sociality. And... Um, so that's an important part of the story. And of course, dopamine is generally an important part of any story that involves learning, whether it's learning by trial and error or learning by imitation or what, whatever. Um, and almost certainly there's much about the story of, of learning that remains, remains to be discovered. Uh, and in particular, that's going to be true about social learning. But quite a lot is being done right now on birds and, and vocal learning and the genes that are necessary to have vocal learning, um, as it is seen in some very special birds like parrots and hummingbirds and, and uh, a few other species. So um, so that's an interesting link. And I I, I bet you're going to ask me, are those same genes involved in learning in humans? And I think the answer is is yes, but I'm not sure. I've kind of forgotten that, actually. Hmm. And so all of these mechanisms that we've been discussing, they suggest to me that our moral beliefs are sort of caused in us, maybe in a similar way uh, to an infant crying. There's something that's like programmed into us. They're innate. And then on a philosophical level, I wonder what that says for you about uh, the state of moral facts or uh, moral truths, I guess. Like what what are your meta-ethical beliefs on... Well, I think you're right that 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 we 
we are social creatures. That's the way we're raped. And I think it is correct now that I've had a few moments to think about it, that that the capacity for vocal learning is related to these known genes. Um, and that if, if you lack those genes, then you, you lack the capacity to, to acquire the speech habits and so forth of, of, of your group. We are intensely social. We learn social um, practices and social skills uh, without even really thinking about it. So we are deeply and intensely social. And I think we have to recognize that often, at least in, in let, let's say, in the ancestral conditions, those norms would have had quite a lot to do with the nature of our, um, our environment and how to thrive in that environment, how to get food, how to reproduce successfully, how to keep warm, how to prevent yourself being eaten by predators and so forth. And then perhaps as time goes on, you would have uh, more complexity within your group and you might develop other kinds of, of norms. But I would bet serious money that in the ancestral conditions of Homo sapiens that, that we were probably monogamous pair bonders. We probably lived uh, in, in the same group for most of our lives. We interacted with other groups and then there was uh, the young would meet other young and they would join the group or mix it up or whatever. Um, and then it was really, as, as you might think, rather basic, except in its, in its own way, it was also very, very complex. Um, so what does that tell us about moral truths? Well, an example, I think it's in one of the books, I suggested that there are some differences between, for example, the, the norms of the Inuit that I met. Uh, when I've been up in the in the far north, and one of them is the the strong feelings they have against lying and fibbing, mm -hmm. and I think it's partly because living in such a cruel, demanding environment. If I tell you there's a seal down in the in the 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 water that we could have for dinner and it turns out ha ha only joking and you waste all that effort <laughs> going down there to get that seal they're apt to be very very uh, uh, annoyed with you yeah and um so we may not have quite that reaction because we live in a much more sumptuous environment um so, so I think we are going to see differences, but I'm constantly struck by the deep similarities between, between cultures. And um, I, the tendency, of course, to find one's own culture as, the, as containing the deep moral truths that all should live by, I guess that temptation is really quite strong. And it's expressed in many religions. Um, but again, you know, sometimes if you look at, at religious um, ideas across different religions, we do see certain kinds of similarities that are kind of striking. We also do see certain kinds of differences. But uh, it's okay, I think, for a person in our kind of culture to say with regard to to an idea that someone else might have. Well, you know, I don't, I don't think I could live by that. Um, and um, without saying, well, you know, you're a moral cretin. Uh, how can you, how can you adhere to such a, how can you adhere to such a principle? So moral arrogance has really always ticked me off actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, I guess the moral high ground or, loosely improving our morality or sense of ethics. Does any of this research or philosophical work point the way to better modalities for rehabilitation? I mean, the, the acknowledgement or the understanding that morality is a, a physical structure or 
the product of a physical structure. It can be, um, it can be affected maybe through medical treatment or surgical treatment. So for instance, people who have, uh, brain tumors, are there any ways in which we can use neuroscience or neurophilosophy to act more morally ourselves? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Um, I don't think so. Partly because, you know, temperament and what you learned as a child and um, <clears throat> your own particular circumstance and so forth is always going to make a, a huge difference. And there remain, even though we do know some things about all uh, about moral behavior, you know, you can still be absolutely dumbfounded at um, the things that people do, both on a small scale on a, and on a large scale. I mean, many people I know who are not sort of woolly or wet behind the ears are just astonished at the stupidity of Putin trying to attack and conquer Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I mean, and it's, it's such a destructive, such a horrible thing to do. It's a horrible thing for him to be doing to his own country. And you, and, and so we wonder how, how is it possible for somebody to come to those kinds of conclusions? And, you know, there's a lot we just don't understand. Um, mm -hmm. He's certainly misled about certain things. And arguably, I mean, one argument is that that's because he spent all his life in the KGB, which is an intelligence outfit, and he doesn't understand the military. That's probably part of it. But who knows what else is going on? Um, mm -hmm. I mean, so, so yeah, it would be nice if there was a goodness pill. And then we could mm -hmm. all take it first thing in the morning and live happily ever after. But I think that's a fantasy, actually. Well, the next very big question that I was hoping we might turn to is free will, because I know there's been a lot of work and speculation about the connection between neuroscience and free will. I I don't know where I read this. Maybe it was in one of Dan Dennett's books. Maybe it was something that was um, debunked. But I seem to recall reading a study in which Maybe somebody was look. Maybe their their brain was wired up to electrodes or something, and they were reading a book. And the decision whether to turn a page or not was sort of registered by these electrodes before they were consciously aware of it. Mm -hmm. And whether or not this story is true or not, I think what I'm getting at is. Does neuroscience undermine our um, capacity for free will at all? Or do, are you a compatibilist uh, on this account? I think I'm a compatibilist. The idea being that, um, th that there are, again, if I can use the, the, the conception of not a precise definition, but the idea that there are concepts are fuzzy boundaried and they have central central examples um i mean the central examples we care about with regard to decision making really have to do with important things where we have control or we lose control and um to have control can mean a number of things it needn't necessarily mean that you're conscious of all aspects of it but that you can be and that you can make a decision um to do otherwise so um i mean it's a very good thing for us that lots and lots of our decisions like turning a page are made subconsciously because otherwise, you know, you'd clutter up your brain with a whole lot of, of stuff that's not serving you very well. Mm -hmm. um, so so it, it's a good thing that those things are done unconsciously. But on the other hand, uh, if you ask me, for, for example, um, 
could you turn off this computer right now and end our conversation? Well, sure I could. Um, do you want me to do it? No, no <laughs> please <yeah>. don't. <laughs> <laughs> but I can do that. Now, sometimes I turn off my computer without thinking about it, and that's because it's at the end of the day and I'm about to go down for dinner and my uh, power of the computer is very low and I need to recharge it. I don't have to go through all that consciously. So I think the worrisome places are really where we want to have control and sometimes we lack control as, um, as a child might lack control when it gets very, very frustrated and, with trying to do something and not being able to. And so it, it might yell and scream and kick and so forth. Um, and that, that's a case of losing control. And we're all, we all lose control once in a while in our lives. And, um, it's not that, that, uh, somehow you suddenly become an automaton. It's just that certain things that hitherto would have had a role in your decision now don't. Um, so I don't know whether that's a very satisfying answer or not, but I've never found it very satisfying to think that I can make all my decisions without any causal antecedent, without the brain being involved at all. I can just decide, you know, to get married. Well, how stupid would that be? So sometimes it, it's the characterization of free will that seems really bizarre. Right. And, and then people like that sort of bizarre thing because they like the idea. They say, well, I, but I'm not just a machine. Well, of course you're not just a machine, but you are a, a, a physical entity, albeit one whose complexity still confounds us. You are a, a, a physical entity that has circuitry that brings about certain things. And um, so I don't know what the idea is for what oneself is in all of that sort of hovering above, yeah. uh, hovering outside. Oh, there's myself, you know, hovering outside. Uh, now I'm going to decide to have potatoes for dinner. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I wanted to go to the self next, actually. But is this a, a correct or an, a somewhat accurate way of interpreting your position that maybe for things like consciousness or morality, it is very useful to go into the neuroscientific literature. But questions of free will can be answered more by just characterizing free will better and you don't need to go into the neuroscience yeah, for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point, and I, it kind of touches on what you opened with, and that was the idea that that as science, any science, whether it's physics or chemistry or what have you, as the science develops, some of our old concepts change, our old ideas change, and we think, oh, I see, okay. And we begin to use the new concepts and we begin to think about things in, in a slightly different way. And I see that already happening with regard to something like decision making. Um, that we know that certain very, that certain background conditions are very important for people to make considered decisions that are in their interest. Mm -hmm. um, for example, that they not be addicted to some drug or that they not right. be drunk or that and so forth. But uh, it, it means that one thread that did exist in philosophy about free will was that it's unconstrained by anything. Yeah. Unconstrained by any physical facts about the brain. That doesn't seem to be true. Mm -hmm. It is interesting, though, that that the fact that our uh, being composed of a, a very complex thing going on in our head doesn't take away 
free will or preclude free will, it yeah. very much feels like it can undermine or limit free will in, I mean, you mentioned addiction. Uh, I, yeah. so like yeah, yeah. I can feel very helpless oh, yeah, uh, yeah. when faced with like the freezer full of ice cream. And it very much feels like the I or myself is powerless oh. against my biology. Yes. Yes, it can feel that way. Mm -hmm. It can feel that way. And that really is because, um, you know, the reinforcement learning system is quite vulnerable to those sorts of things, to sugar or to alcohol or to opiates. We really like those things. And it causes the reinforcement learning system to say, yeah, yeah, go for it. And there have to be other kind of elements in play, which is why we have to be very careful uh, about those kinds of things. Absolutely. Yeah. It's So in this sense, it's, it seems like I, I'm pointing to the ice cream. There is a, <laughs> there is a me in here that feels like an I. Uh, and then there are other parts of me that don't have a voice, but have a say in my decision making. Yeah. And, it's been a long time since I read anything about this. I'm not sure if it was about schizophrenia or oh, I think I think it it might be about schizophrenia and multiple personality disorder. So schizophrenics. I think this was this was not neuroscience, but it was philosoph philosophy of mind. Uh, but schizophrenia comes around perhaps when there is something going something wrong with the brain and part of your internal voice is no longer really conscious and it feels like it's coming from outside of your consciousness yeah. Yeah. whereas multiple personality disorder there are sort of multiple senses of self in your mm -hmm. brain that are uh, obviously a product of, of faulty wiring to speak loosely uh, mm -hmm. but i'm curious if your research has ever brought you to studies that indicate why we have this narrative center of gravity in our brains or how that's mediated by the brain? Um, let me think. I mean, uh, nothing really springs to mind um, at, at the moment that is, sure, sure. that is particularly useful, but um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that, that um, it in a in a very loose and informal way, it's easy to see the utility of having this sense of, of oneself as doing things and making decisions and and um, being the one that goes to sleep and the one that wakes up and and so forth. But it, at the same time, your, your point about schizophrenia is well taken because there must be something about that system that is actually quite vulnerable. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, the other That's a great part of it is use. that it can also be very robust. So one of the people I met who really astonished me was a patient of uh, the Damasios in Iowa City. And... I can use his name now. It was Roger Boswell. And Boswell had herpes simplex encephalitis uh, when he was in his 50s. And a result of that was that he lost uh, brain tissue that allowed him to make new memories. It also took brain tissue that allowed him to recover old memories. So he was really in bad shape. And so when you would meet him, he would have about a 20 to 30 second time frame. But what astonished me was how, um, how he clearly had a sense of himself. He knew when he needed to go to the bathroom, he shook your hand, he would always comment. He, was, he said, you ask him, what did you do? Uh, when you worked. And uh, he said, well, you know, it's hard to say because he couldn't remember, but he was a used car salesman. <laughs> and he had the kind of, you know, smoothness that that he had when he was a used car salesman. And he was very um, 
very gracious, very kindly, and he spoke well. And But then if you would distract him, he'd come back and it would be, oh, and how are you? And who are you? Because um, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't remember. But the fact that he had this sense of himself as interacting with you and as being hungry or as wanting coffee, uh, I want coffee is something he could say. Um, it, it really found, I found it very striking that that sense of himself was so robust, given that he had lost so much of his autobiographical memory, of his world memory, yeah. and so forth. Mm -hmm. What jumped out about me, jumped out at me most about what you've just said, though, was your use of the word vulnerable when uh, actually referring to my anecdote about schizophrenia, mm -hmm. because the fact that schizophrenia is, I mean, so relatively common yeah. suggests that there is some easily, I don't know, patterned or replicable underlying brain structure that can be altered to produce this very dramatic effect. Um, well, I think the genetic studies are the things that are making progress on this. Um, I mean, there, I don't know about schizophrenia in particular, but I do remember reading, I think it was just yesterday morning, that uh, genes connected to autism um, have now been uh, have now been to some significant degree identified, and I think the belief is that we will find similar connection. There, there will be genetic connections to to schizophrenia. Um, the other side of that is people wonder: Well, it, are there cases where those genes are present and they confer some kind of big advantage? without allowing for the full expression of the phenotype, of the schizophrenic phenotype. And I, I don't think that that's understood, but it's been known for a very long time that it, it does, as they say, run in families. Um, and so um, the pursuit of a genetic link may not be the only sort of causally relevant factor, but the pursuit of a genetic link is, I think, really warranted. Mm -hmm. It's something that uh, is, so we, we talked a little bit about, and it's, it's hard to find precise language uh, to use it to describe this, but my identification with parts of my cognition, but not other parts of my cognition. But there's also, I think, some very, very interesting question surrounding identification with our phys our bodies because yeah. in a sense we, we feel like we occupy our bodies we don't i don't know i don't feel like identical with my hand per se but there are people who really i mean maybe body image disorder i mean a lot of people struggle from that i have that and i'll look at i'll look at my body or and not like it and feel like it really isn't mine but more <laughs> dramatically i think there are people who will like maybe look at a foot at their foot and think, this is not my foot. I want to get it amputated. I identify as yeah. somebody who's amputated. And uh, an interesting thing that I'd heard, I, again, I, I don't know where, but if you have like a post nasal drip and you have mucus in your mouth, um, it doesn't particularly perturb you to have it in there. It's not gross. But if you spit it out like onto a plate and then look at it and consider putting it back in your mouth, <laughs> it suddenly becomes absolutely disgusting. Like you would not want to do that. And so That's it's very funny. interesting that when it's internal, it, you identify it as part of you, but not when it's outside of you. That's and, very funny. Yeah. But I'm I'm wondering if there are any brain mechanisms that you know of that make me feel like my hand is mine in in a way. I guess pain is one thing or or I'm obviously going to want to protect my hand because if it hurt, I don't want it to hurt because I will feel that. But I I, don't, I maybe I'm having trouble being more precise with this. 
Yeah, I think there are real puzzles about about these things. Um, okay. Well, that's encouraging. <laughs> I think so. I mean, I don't feel any great loss if I have a I have a haircut. Right? I don't feel, oh my gosh, you know, part of me's gone down there on the floor. Yeah, that's uh, I don't really. Um, but I'm sure if you cut my hand off, I would. Um, mm -hmm. But without getting to, I, I'm sure that there are people who've kind of looked into this and have have more more to say about it. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, puzzle well, around for sure. Hmm. Well, the next thing that I was curious about, and I know you've you've done a lot of thought on this, is consciousness. Uh, maybe. I mean, other than representation, I mean, one of the biggest areas in mm -hmm. philosophy of mind. And I saw recently on Twitter, you said, or you and David Chalmers had an exchange and you two are old friends. But David Chalmers has identified what he calls the, the hard problem of consciousness, which I take to be sort of like giving an explanation of how it is that we really, we really feel things, that sense of I or we really have experiences, how do we explain qualia? Um, do you, or, or go ahead, you were going to say something. I think the fact that we don't have a full explanation doesn't mean a thing. So what? Mm -hmm. I mean, why would you expect that? Um, so does that mean, is that a denial that it is the hard, a hard problem? Well, look, there's many, many hard problems. David tried to make it out that consciousness was so special that it probably isn't a physical phenomenon of the brain at all, mm -hmm. right? and psychism. And here, remember how the argument goes. The argument is, I can imagine a zombie who's exactly like me in every respect that has to do with behavior and yet is not conscious. And because I can imagine that, that tells me, according to Chalmers, that um, consciousness is not part of the physical world at all. It's, there is some possible world. Now, we're talking reification of an idea, right? This <laughs> Armchair <laughs> philosophy. There is, there is actually a possible world in which there are such zombies and they're not conscious. And so consciousness doesn't have to do, have anything to do with the physical brain. So first of all, it's an outrageous argument. So here's my, my outrageous argument to go along with it. Please, please. So a ph physicists tell us that you cannot travel faster than the speed of light. Really? Well, here I am sitting here right now. I'm imagining traveling faster than the speed of light. In fact, there is some possible world in which I travel faster than the speed of light. So the physicists are wrong. <laughs> well, really? I mean, <laughs> that's an argument from ignorance. It's an argument from ignorance about why the physicists say that. And David's argument is an argument from ignorance. It's about what he doesn't know about the relationship between being asleep and being awake or paying attention or seeing colors or feeling pain and events in the brain. And so when he singles out consciousness as a uniquely hard problem, uh, it's it's very misleading to put it politely. And so I think that a lot of philosophers wasted a lot of good years trying to explain to us why rocks and cow pies and electrons really are conscious if the brain is conscious or when pi why panpsychism has to be true uh, or why nothing is conscious, even including ourselves. And so I, I, it just seems to me that there is lots of really wonderful work going on in neuroscience. 
that helps us understand things that we might not have understood before. And the idea that if we can't understand consciousness now, then that's because it's a hard problem and we never will because it's a mystical property. I think that's a bit hasty. I'm not quite mm -hmm. ready to go there yet. We don't yeah. even understand motor control very well yet or how it is that that uh, Yu Jo Wong, for example, can play Flight of the Bumblebee at such incredible speed on the piano. How is that physically possible that she could do that? It must be a hard problem. It's got to be a hard problem. It can't be that she's really playing Flight of the Bumblebee. It must be that some spirit has taken over and, uh, and that's really what's playing Flight of the Bumblebee on the piano. Well, you know, that's fun. And it's fun if 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 you're in a bar having having a beer, but it's not really where the science is. Mm -hmm. Now, has neuroscience gotten us closer to solving this problem? Are there studies that tell us, or groups of studies that tell us how consciousness might emerge, if not giving us the whole picture? Because well, I think that, that there's lots and lots of work that's relevant to it. I don't think we have the whole story yet, but we don't have the whole story on learning and memory either. We don't think that's mm -hmm. mystical. Uh, we don't, there's so much we don't know about skill learning, physical skill learning, and and how that that information about sequences, for example, how that can be stored. Um, but... For all of these questions, including questions about paying attention and being aware of something, whereas not paying attention and not being aware of it, we know more about that contrast in the brain. We know more about that now than we did, say, 20 years ago. Is that relevant? Well, sure as heck looks like it, but, you know, let's wait and see. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, with regard to the difference between being asleep and being awake or being under anesthesia and being awake. Uh, are there differences there? Well, yeah. So under anesthesia, you're not conscious. When you're awake, you are. What's the difference in the brain? And if we can understand some of that, that's a step towards making progress. If we can't make progress in one single bound, is does that mean we may as well give up and go back to magic? I kind of don't think so. Mm -hmm. I'm not ready for that. Now, as you know, the science is endlessly fascinating. Do you <laughs> have on the top of your off the top of your head any recollection or insight into the science of what the mechanisms are in the brain that produce consciousness? Well, I think it's going to be a fairly large story. Um, it kind of looks like um, birds have have capacity for that and that other mammals also do. Maybe not the, the same range as we do. Yeah. Uh, we know that brainstem structures are extremely important for that, that probably hypothalamic structures uh, are important. Uh, we don't know how much um, elsewhere is is really uh, exactly how how that works, but I mean we we've known for quite some time that those kinds of structures in the, in those regions, I mean there's a lot of stuff there uh, have have a role to play. Doping that out isn't easy. Maybe to play the devil's advocate in the form of David. Uh, sure. I don't. I don't know if he would say anything like this. But how could you tell from looking at brain scans of a bird that that bird is conscious or is having something like uh, to use a a word that you might not like a phenomenological sure. experience? Well, you could see the difference in the brain at least between when it's awake and hopping around and uh, getting food and so forth, you could see the difference between that state and when it's under anesthesia. Oh, it turns out it's much the same as the difference between when a vole is up and about and hunting and when it's under anesthesia. Oh, it's similar to when a human is blah, blah, blah. Um, 
so so there's really some quite good ways of answering these yeah. these, these kinds of kinds of questions um and of course sleep has been studied for a long time uh, long before we had functional MR, you know, people would just put electrodes on the head and they got really quite interesting data. And, uh, and we know that deep sleep is very different from dreaming sleep. Are you conscious during dreaming sleep? Well, quite often I am. Um, <laughs> yeah. and are you conscious during uh, so-called deep sleep? Well, presumably not. I mean, I'm not around to, to check it out, but uh, yeah. So, so there, there are really interesting ways of making progress here, and some of them are, are quite new, and some of them are not at all new. And um, I think David just found it very convenient not to worry too much about that. Mm -hmm. Well, back to the, the birds, I guess, or maybe... I'm using birds as uh, as a proxy for bats in this case, but oh, yeah. so science has given us. I, I'll I'll say it like indirect evidence in this case for consciousness, and that you can compare the the sleeping states to the waking states, and that suggests to you that okay, they're conscious in one and not the other. Yeah. But could the neuroscience ever, in principle, give us and give us much of a convincing answer to Nagel's question of like what it's like to be a bat, or in this case, a, a bird, maybe? Well, I don't even really understand the question. Okay. I really don't. I mean, what is it like to be me? Well, it's to be me, I guess. I mean, what kind of an answer is that? And so so yeah. I always thought that description mm. was kind of framed in such a way that you could never give an answer to it. Yeah. That would be very helpful um, especially in the context of, of the brain. I should just mention, too, that, you know, there are other ways of um, investigating the brain than, than just looking at sleep and dreaming and anesthesia and so forth, but mm. having, you know, microelectrodes where you stimulate subliminally or supraliminally and see what the difference is. You know, does the, does the individual see the color or not? And you can tell by the response. Um, and the people have gotten very clever at getting um, recording responses in, in animals and other things. So, so I think that there's lots and lots of ways of making progress. On yeah, things. no, that's actually that's a very fascinating response. I mean, anything I could say to you really about my experience, like, oh, I'm seeing red right now. Big you deal. you should be able to say that about a uh, a bird if you figure out what neurons are firing yeah. when they're seeing bread you should then you should be able to give just yeah. the same sort of verbal description you could about a human yeah yeah so that's an interesting yeah. way of and I think it. we can do that for lots of things you know for for example for for feeling pleasure or for feeling aggression yeah um and micro stimulations will will produce those effects and and you can and you can huh. so, so what you have to do i think is not sort of give up too soon and yeah. uh, and the problem really was that david gave up way too soon he gave up way before the science the science was done yeah, but I, so now I'm just thinking how fascinating it would be. I mean, it's at least conceivable. I guess I'm in the armchair right now. But you could come up with an algorithm. And if you had enough understanding about the brain, you put some electrodes or some, some device on a bird. And the computer or the algorithm will then give you a typed out description of everything it's feeling. Oh, it's seeing red. Oh, it's smelling this. Oh, it's feeling pleasure on its on its foot. I mean, and, and that's just going to be anything you can get from a human. So, mm -hmm. um, if it's like something to be me and I can explain that to you, then mm -hmm. we then should be able not? to yeah. provide yeah. a similar explanation on the behalf of a bird. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I really like that. We've done some, some <laughs> I like philosophy it today. Yeah, now, I think so. I think, I think you want to just not, um, buy into the picture that, and David Chalmers wasn't the only one, God bless him. Uh, but you don't want to buy into the picture that philosophers peddled. 
um, that this is all too hard and anyhow neuroscience is irrelevant and uh, we'll never learn anything anyway and uh, and we should just take our intuition seriously and, and you know call it a day and you know, I... I have to tell you about. Um, I think I mentioned this on the Twitter response to to uh, to David the other day, and that is the physicist John Wheeler had this very. You know, he was at Princeton. He was a cosmologist, and I think he had had a lot of encounters with various philosophers. And he said, "You know, philosophers are like tin cans tied to the back of a car. They make a lot of noise. They're always behind, and they never advance the project forward." <laughs> what a great <laughs> I know and um and uh so I mean it's a little harsh but mm -hmm. um but we want to be careful of going going that way as philosophers and uh, mm -hmm. uh not not we don't want to put ourselves into into that, that particular framework I think that that is very much one possible way that philosophers can be another that I've heard however that I also uh, find a little more promising. Um, a professor of, of mine at Stanford, Nadim Hussein, uh, said this, that philosophers are the ones who handle the really difficult problems. And as soon as they become tractable, then yeah. they're given off to the subdiscipline. So, I mean, a lot of these problems started with philosophers like Aristotle. Oh, yeah, yeah. And as they've become tractable, then they then they go to physics or linguistics or yeah, yeah. mathematics or something. Yeah, like no, that. I think I think something like that is is true. Um, I mean, the question of what is the nature of life? You know, when I was in school in high school in my little uh, backwoods village, I had a biology teacher who was a vitalist. I mean, just as 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 some people are panpsychists, he was a vitalist. He said, "How can you possibly get livingness itself out of dead stuff? You can't." So, livingness itself, vital spirit, it must be in everything that that is alive. Yeah. Nobody thinks that anymore, and you yeah. have to ask yourself why. It's not just because it's unfashionable. It's unfashionable for a reason. And that is we have quite a good understanding now of the molecular structures that support being alive. Right. And uh, so we don't need the idea of vital spirit anymore. And I think something similar is sort of true in the case of of um, the the soul or the spirit, the human spirit, uh, unless you just mean you know the human spirit is you know uh, your the degree to which you have get up and go, but um, we don't really need the idea of of a soul. Right, and um, they're similar in the way in the sense that this idea of the spirit will go the way that vitalism went. I think so. Mm -hmm. I kind of think so. yeah. Now, my last question on consciousness, which I think will be pretty brief, is consciousness isn't just like it's on or it's off. Absolutely. It, right. Um, and it's it's super textural, to use a word, it's subtle. It's really fluid. We can have very different sorts of experiences. And then on the one hand, I mean, I can have anger redness, uh, wonder, dreams. Does all of this suggest maybe that there won't be some single explanation for what consciousness is? It's not going to be like a one sentence answer. There, there might just be all of these different small answers. Oh, this is how we experience color. This is how we experience so-and-so. And then it's just this very complicated picture of how it all comes together in the brain to form what we reductively refer to as consciousness. Anything is possible. I, you know, um, th there, there is a tremendous amount of progress yet to be made in understanding brains. And uh, I, you know, I feel rather foolish predicting what it's going to look like. Well, thank you so much. Again, this has been a huge honor to talk to you. Um, okay. It's really been great. Okay, it has been good too. So thanks so much. <laughs>